Hey, a couple of quick reminders. One is uh, there is an early version of the final exam. I think a regularly scheduled final is on the Monday of the final exams week. But on Wednesday, there is an early version that there's a Google sheet to sign up on. And about half of you have already signed up. So I know a lot of people planning to take it early. So if you want to be on the early list, go on. And if you feel you want to move it back, not a big deal. Just remove your name from the list so I know how many people will be taking the final early. But that's just a reminder. Okay. Your project is due the last day of class, which is May 8th. Right? So that's why I said the to-do list. It's kind of, it's, uh, it's fairly organized. Check the attachment if you didn't open it to the Thursday email, because that is a, the, the full list of everything for the project. So let's pick up where we left off. We're talking about the adjusted present value approach. Three steps, right? First, you compute the unleavened firm value, the value of the company with no debt. And we'll talk about two ways of doing it. One is to do a full-fledged valuation using the unleavened cost of equity as your discount rate. The other is to back out from the market cap of the company and the enterprise value, what the value would have been if they did not have debt. And I'll give you the example with Disney how to do that. Second step, you want to compute the tax benefits from debt. It's true, just, just the interest expenses get you the tax benefits. The present value of those interest expenses over time, especially if your debt is permanent, can accumulate to a fairly large chunk of the debt. In fact, a rough approximation is if you can tell me how much money you borrowed for the long term and you tell me your tax rate, your tax rate times your dollar debt is actually the tax benefits from debt. So I said the first two steps are easy, but the third step is a nightmare. Third step, you, go to, you have to compute the expected bankruptcy cost. And there are two numbers you need. The first is the probability that you will go bankrupt at every debt ratio, 10%, 20%. So let's start with the easy part. As you borrow more, what should happen to that probability? It should go up or down. It should increase as your debt ratio increases because you have more debt for the same company, the likelihood that you can go bankrupt should go up. The second component of the expected bankruptcy cost is what the actual cost is. And that is where it gets troublesome. I'm going to try, but I'm going to be very clear that even as I try, I'm feeling very uncertain about this number. So let's start with the easy half of this equation. Let's talk about the probability of bankruptcy. Remember how we got the rating for a company at every debt ratio? We used the interest coverage ratio to come up with the rating. If you know the rating for a company, can you also roughly estimate the likelihood of bankruptcy based on that? I mean, we have 100 years of history on ratings. And if you have 100 years of history on ratings, you can track what percentage of debt in each ratings class default in the 10 years after, the 20 years after. In fact, S&P and Moody's maintain every year they update this table. They tell you what percentage of bonds, they do it for marketing purposes. You know what I mean by marketing purposes? 
they show, look, our ratings actually work only 0.07% or 0.05% of AAA rated companies go bankrupt, but look at the triple B, look at the double B, look at the C. And, I, you know, and that's good data that we can use to estimate the probability of bankruptcy. So that part, I think I can pull off using the same process I use for synthetic ratings by looking at the rating and estimating the likelihood of bankruptcy. On the bankruptcy cost, the hand waving is going to begin. It's, it's been estimated through studies that the direct bankruptcy cost, this is actually the legal cost of actually going bankrupt, talked about how many years it took after Lehman went bankrupt for the process to roll out, works out about 5 to 10% of firm value. That's a pretty large chunk, right? You have a $100 billion company, 5 to $10 billion. That's the easy part. The indirect bankruptcy costs, people not buying your products because they think you're in trouble, suppliers demanding cash because they think you won't pay them back, employees leaving because they don't think you will be around. Nobody really knows, but we know it can be a big number of some companies and small of other companies. A grocery store, which is at the low end of that cost spectrum, probably can get away with 5% of value, but a company like Boeing, it could be 40% of value. If you add those two together, you can see that the bankruptcy cost can range from a low of 10 to 15% to as high as 40%. So I'm going to try, as I said, to do this for Disney, but let's start the process with the property bankruptcy. Ed Altman, oh, no, I, does Ed still teach a fixed income class? No. But for his legendary, he taught, the, he, he taught the, the default risk and the bankruptcy class from the late 60s all the way through probably a couple of years ago. Every year he used to do a table. And this he started this process of taking the ratings for companies. And actually, he would look at what percentage of bonds in each ratings class failed. So the way to read this is if you track, you know, let's say single A rated companies for the 10 years after. 0.66% of the bonds defaulted. That's tiny, right? You take a double B rated bond, 16.6% defaulted. In fact, we use this to get failure rates for companies as well. It's the same process. It's a, it's a likelihood of bankruptcy. So if you can estimate the rating for a company, these bankruptcy properties can be used. Ed, I think, stopped updating his data, I think, five, six years ago. But as I said, I'll send you the links to S&P and Moody's because they do this every year. You can see what those percentages are on a year-to-year -year basis. So I'm going to try this on Disney with all the trepidation of, I really don't know what the bankruptcy cost is, but I'm going to try. So this is a true APV approach. And the next time you see somebody saying, I want to use APV, you want to push them to get as close as they can to this approach. What's the first step? I want to get an unlevered firm value for Disney. And I want to make this all about capital structure. I want to make the capital structure the star of the show. So rather than do a full-fledged valuation, I started with the enterprise value. Of, in this case, I just started with the enterprise value for Disney of $137.9 billion. That's their existing enterprise value. That existing enterprise value reflects the existing debt that Disney has. And I'm going to play a little hypothetical game. I said, if Disney had no debt, what would the enterprise value look like? So if Disney has no debt, what's the first thing that's going to disappear? All the tax benefits are going to be gone. So I took the 15,961 and I took multiplied by the tax. Remember, I said that gives you the approximation. And I said that won't be there anymore. I'm going to subtract it out. Is everybody clear why I'm subtracting it out? If you pay off the debt, that tax benefit is gone. That's a bad side of reducing debt. The good side is the bankruptcy cost that they have right now, 0.66%, will also go away. So if I take away, the, so in this case, 0.66% will be the expected likelihood of bankruptcy. The cost of bankruptcy, I'm going to assume, and I'll be you know, quite clear, I'm not sure about this number. This is the softest number in the calculation. I've estimated be about 25%. Midway between the grocery store and Boeing, because I don't think Disney is as affected as Boeing would be, 25% of firm value. 0.66% times 25% of 137,839 gives me an expected bankruptcy cost, and I'm adding it back. And again, I want to be clear why I'm adding it back. Because I'm paying off the debt, my bankruptcy cost goes out. So I've Take away the tax benefits. I add back the expected bankruptcy costs. There's the value that I get for Disney as my unlevered firm value. 
That's going to be my starting point. If they have no debt, their value would be 132.3 billion. The next table is just building on that value. So at every debt ratio, I compute the dollar debt. I compute the tax benefits from that debt by multiplying the dollar debt by the tax rate, accepting the fact that at very high debt ratios, I will not get the full tax benefit because I don't have the interest expense covered. So same reasoning that we use for capital structure. So there are my tax benefits from debt. And in fact, at very, very high debt ratios, you can see I actually start to lose tax benefits relative to my peak tax. I think my tax benefits peak at 70% debt, but as I get to higher debt ratios, I'm actually even starting. So you definitely don't want to get above 70% debt here because you don't even get the good stuff. The expected bankruptcy cost, I get by first computing the rating. So same process as before, but using the rating to get a property of default now. And that property of default gives me an expected bankruptcy cost, which starts to climb as I get from 0% debt to 10% debt to 20% debt, all the way to 90% debt. My firm value is my unlevered firm value, which is always 132.3 billion, plus the tax benefit minus the expected bankruptcy cost. There's the value for my levered firm. Remind me again what the objective in corporate finance is. What am I trying to do? Maximize the value of the firm. And if I stay true to that notion, my value is maximized at 40%. Now you should get suspicious here because my optimal with the cost to capital approach was 40%. You have no idea what I started with as a bankruptcy cost. If I'd started with 50% of my bankruptcy cost for Disney, my optimal would have been like 20 to 30%. If I'd used 10%, so it, this might be, I'm just playing games to make it, the two approaches will almost never converge. I just got lucky here. Because that 25% is driving this optimal. If you want to try a 30, 40, 50, the optimal will go down. Try a lower number, the optimal will go up. But if the adjusted present value approach is that sensitive to what the bankruptcy cost is. How the heck can you ignore it when you do an adjusted present value approach? It has to be central to your calculation. So I'm willing to accept people saying, I want to use the APV approach if they're serious about computing this bankruptcy cost. Maybe they've come up with a clever and ingenious way of estimating what it is, but without it, you cannot compute the optimal debt ratio with an APV approach. So if you want to compare the two approaches, the cost to capital approach, the cost to capital does all the work of capturing how as the debt ratio changes, the value changes. In this approach, rather than make the cost of capital carry the weight, you compute the tax benefits, the expected bankruptcy costs to come up with the optimal debt ratio for a company. So we've looked at cost of capital, enhanced cost of capital, APV. None of this is rocket science, right? You'd think that, $100 billion companies, trillion dollar companies should be doing this routinely, computing what their optimal is and figuring out where they are. But that's not the way most companies decide how much to borrow. Most companies choose how much to borrow by looking at what everybody else is doing. So if you're a steel company, look at other steel companies. So it's a way capital structure has been set right from the beginning of time, I would think in terms of how much you borrow. And lenders go along as well. They measure how much, how much debt you have by looking at your peer group. So whether you like it or not, you might think it's irrational to look at the peer group. I think it makes sense to look at what the rest of the companies in your sector are doing. My problem with doing this is not that people look at the sector, but that they don't look for differences across companies within the sector. On what dimensions? If you're looking at telecom companies in Europe, I would expect Deutsche Telekom to carry more debt than Irish Telekom. Why? Because the tax rate in Germany is higher. So I would expect companies that face higher tax rates to have higher debt ratios. I would expect companies where insiders don't run the company to borrow more because that can be a much better disciplining mechanism if you have a separation between managers and shareholders. I would also expect companies with more stable income to borrow more because they should have a lower probability of bankruptcy. And finally, Companies with a lot more intangible assets should borrow less because they face more agency costs. In fact, using the trade-off, I would argue that even within sectors that look homogeneous, you should see differences in debt ratios. But let's start with the simplistic comparison. I have my four companies here. And again, I'm going to ignore Deutsche because really I don't even know what the debt ratio is. I could compute the regulatory capital ratios, which we do all the time. 
for the four non-financial service companies, there are the debt ratios. You're saying, why are there four debt ratios? Because I do both book value and market value. I know in corporate finance, we never use book value. But if you're doing a peer group comparison, who knows what you compare yourself on? You might choose to compare yourself on book value. I have gross debt ratios and net debt ratios. Remember, net debt ratios are net the cash out. So there are the numbers for each company. Let's say Disney. There are, there are the numbers for my company based on book value and market value. There are the numbers for entertainment companies. I might be seeing things, but it looks across, if you look at the four companies, that a lot of what you see at these companies is driven by what you see in the sector. Baidu, if you look at their book, and, uh, their book debt ratio is high, but the market debt ratio is low, but they're in sectors with low debt ratios. In fact, if you look at global online advertising, the net debt ratio is actually negative for the industry because they have more cash than debt. This is a sector with very little debt. I'm not surprised that Baidu also borrows very little money. So when you do this comparison, you're just comparing your company to the industry average and you're stopping there. And if you were going to pass judgment, you say, my company is over levered because there's more debt than the industry average. And I think that's unfair because you're not controlling for differences across companies. So I'm going to give you a twist and you, you can choose to use it. You can choose not to use it on comparison to other companies. We control for differences. And I'm going to use a statistical technique. I'm going to run a regression of what of debt ratios. And I choose market debt ratios, market debt to capital, because that's my preferred metric. But if you prefer book debt ratios, you can use them as well. And I'm going to run a regression against the tax rate. My hypothesis would be higher tax rate companies should have higher debt ratios. How variable earnings are, in which case I'm going to measure the variance in earnings for every company. Again, the argument is companies with more variable earnings should have lower debt ratios. And finally, how much cash they generate. EBIT does a person of firm value. So I picked these variables deliberately because they reflected the trade-off on debt. I run this regression across the sector. Somebody with enough memory of statistics classes tell me what I do after I run the regression. We have regression packages now. Debt ratios in three variables. What's the first number I look at to decide whether I'm even going to use this regression? I'm going to look at the R squared. The R squared is 2%. I'm going to say, I can't explain it. I might as well use the average. If the R squared is 30 or 40%, what's the next step? I have three variables in my regression because I thought they should be in there. But what I think doesn't matter, the data is going to tell me whether it matters. So what do I check to see if they actually matter? I look at the T-statistics or the standard errors to see if they belong. If they belong, then I have a regression that is good predictive value, variables that explain. I plug my company's tax rate, earnings variability, and EBITDA as a percentage of enterprise value to regression. What am I going to get? I'm going to get a predicted debt ratio for my company. How do I read that? Given how other companies in my sector are setting debt ratios, this is what my debt ratio should be as a company. So it's a more refined version of comparing the average because it controls for differences across companies. So I tried this on Tata Motors. I took the automobile business. I ran a regression against the tax rate. EBITDA is a percent of enterprise value. I tried earnings variability, but it didn't seem to matter in the sector. What seemed to drive debt ratios more was how much capital expenditure these companies had as a percent of enterprise value. The R squared was 21%. And is it good? Is it bad? It's neither good nor bad. It is what it is. In this sector, about one-fifth of the variation in debt ratios across companies can be explained by fundamentals. What's the other 80%? A lot of company-specific noise. Conservative managers, aggressive managers, country, you know, companies in different countries, driving tax rates, how much governments protect you against bankruptcy. But the R squared was 21%. And the standard errors and the T-statistics all suggest the variables matter. I plugged in Tata Motors, debt, no, tax rate, EBITDA, and CapEx into the regression, got a predicted debt ratio of 18.5%. Now, when I look at that, that's a, that's a point estimate, right? A predicted value. What does the R squared come into play here with that? If the R squared were 100%, there's 18.5%. Would not be an estimate, it would be a fact, right? It'd be perfect. 
An R squared of 21% means there's a range around that number. How big? If you have a regression package, likely you give you a range. It'll say 16 to 26%. The lower the R squared, the bigger the range. So rather than sit there and judge R squares for yourself, say, that looks low, that looks high, accept it for what it is because the range is going to be reflective of that R squared. Final step in the process, I compare Tata Motors' actual debt ratio to the predicted debt ratio. I'm ready to make a statement about Tata Motors. Given how other automobile companies are borrowing money, it looks like Tata Motors is over levered. It has too much debt. It was outside the range. In fact, I computed the range was outside the range. It's over levered. This is good news because if I'm trying to convince Tata Motors that they're over levered, Remember the cost of capital approach? I concluded they were over levered. Now I've added ammunition when I go to managers saying, look, you have too much debt. And if you don't like my cost of capital approach, re relative to other companies in your sector, you borrowed too much. And it's a much more effective sales pitch. Because the problem is when your cost of capital approach says you're over levered, but this approach says you're under levered, you might as well give up. Because they're going to go with the peer group almost every single time. Any questions on this regression? Incidentally, I, I don't expect you to run this regression on your project, but if you wanted to, you have the data in S&P Capital IQ, you can download the data on debt ratios and whatever you think, three or four variables. Just check it out, just out of cure, even if you don't think you will run this regression, just run, you know, download the debt ratios for their sector and get a sense of what's high, what's low, what the companies in your sector are doing because it will give you added richness when you make a recommendation for your company. Now, once you control for differences across companies, you're no longer sector restricted. I can run this regression across the entire market. And every year I do. This was my 2014 regression at the time that I was looking at Disney. And I ran the regression for the entire market. So the ETR is the effective tax rate. G is the growth. Again, each of these variables is in there because I think they affect the debt ratio. There are the T statistics, and you can see that they're all statistically significant. But I'll give away the bad news. The R squared was 8%. Am I disappointed? Again, I, it's not a question of disappointment. It is what it is. Across all US companies, there's a lot of stuff that's happening on debt ratios that I cannot explain. Yes? You, try to account for like, uh, you could throw in market cap. I, try, I did throw in market cap. It didn't make a difference. Maybe you could, because, get, but before you do that, they'll give me a hypothesis for why you think market, the size of the company should matter. Just because smaller companies would be more worried. Uh, right. Okay, so smaller companies might face more capital rationing constraints, they value financial flexibility more. So what I would argue is whenever you decide to throw a variable, always back up the variable because one of the most dangerous places to be in statistics when you start throwing variables in just because it'll push up the R squared. Always have underlying intuition as to what you will read the coefficient on the variable before you throw it in. So 8%. Now, low R squared, but the T statistics are significant. I plugged in Disney's numbers into that regression. Again, I'm doing it with open eyes. I know that my predicted value is going to come with a big range because of the low R squared, but it's still a predictive regression. I'm going to use the predictive regression. I come up with 18.9%. How would I describe that 18.9%? This is how much Disney's debt ratio should be given how the rest of the companies in the U.S. market are borrowing money. Will this number kind of match up to what my optimal is? Or when will the two numbers diverge? So let's say you do this on company after company. Would you expect this number to kind of center around the optimal or diverge? And if it does diverge, what will cause it to diverge? <coughs> How do I describe this 18.9%? This Given how other companies are borrowing money, this is how much Disney should. Are there markets where companies can sometimes all get caught up in the fever of the moment and start borrowing too much? Absolutely. Happened in Korea in the 1990s and was driven by the Korean government essentially offering to act as an implicit guarantor of corporate loans. So Korea wanted to grow. I mean, they wanted the economy to grow fast. The government, in a sense, sent a message to banks saying, 
you can lend money to Samsung and Hyundai and you know, we will back it up if the debt gets into trouble. They did it with the best of intention. They wanted banks to lend these companies more money so they could grow faster. And they actually were willing to back up the loans if one of these companies got into trouble. In 1996, here's what happened. The Korean economy went into a tailspin. It's not just one company. Every Korean company discovered it had too much debt. And the Korean government said, we don't have enough money to back you all up. That triggered a kind of meltdown in the Korean market. So what I'm saying is when all companies end up borrowing too much money, this regression will say you're okay. You look okay relative to everybody else, but you're not okay. And that's why I think it's not an either or. I would do the relative analysis, but I've all, I would also still do the APV or the cost of capital approach because that looks at whether you can actually borrow money and whether companies are overreach. So let me summarize what I found with the companies in my list with all of the different approaches. We take Disney because I tried every single approach. Their actual debt ratio is 11.6%. With the, with the, there was an operating income approach that I tried that I'm not even going to describe to you, but basically the operating income approach is that what's the most I can borrow without hitting a constraint. The constraint might be, I don't want my operating income to drop below zero or, or, or something that, that you build in as a constraint. There I came up with 35%. The cost of capital approach is then, if you remember the optimal debt ratio is 40%. I did introduce bankruptcy costs, but it stayed at 40%. The APV approach, also I got 40%. So I got three 40s in a row. And I compared to the industry, it looked like they should be about 29%. So I actually ran an entertainment sector regression and came up with 29%. And against the market, I've got about 19%. On every single metric, it looks like Disney has excess debt capacity. So I don't think you can argue that Disney can't borrow more. We can argue how much it can borrow because with the relative analysis, it could go from 10, you know, 11 to 20%. The cost of capital approaches looks like it can go to more, but on every single approach, it looks like Disney is under level. Take Tata Motors, 29% debt. Overlevered against all three approaches, the cost of capital, the enhanced cost of capital, and the APV approach, and overlevered relative to the center. So Tata Motors looks like it's overlevered, no matter how you slice the dice and which approach you use for the optimal. With Vale 35.48, it depends on whether you think the cycle is going to revert back. If you think the cycle is going to revert back and I know prices are going to go up, it looks underlevered. But if you think that might not happen, it's overlevered. And relative to the sector, it looks overlapped. So basically, given where other mining companies are, it looks like it has too much debt. And finally, for Baidu, debt ratio 5%, it looks like they have some debt capacity, but not a huge amount with any of these approaches. But relative to the industry, it's actually overlapped. It has too much debt, given how little debt a typical online advertising company does. So you don't have to put all of your you know, time into one approach. You can try two to see whether they, they confirm your basic conclusion. But you're trying to get a sense of, does my company have the capacity to borrow money? And one final point, when I did my optimal debt ratios, I moved in 10% increments, right? Why do you think I didn't move in 1% increments? I could have, I could have said, I mean, it's a tedious spreadsheet, but I could have done 1%, 2 So why do you think I moved in 10% increments as opposed to 1% increments? Looks like I'd get more precise answer, right? I'd get the optimal debt ratio for Disney. I could move to the second decimal point. In fact, I could probably set up the spreadsheet to solve for the optimal and say the optimal debt ratio for Disney is 37.25%. Have I ever heard of false precision? False precision is what happens when you fall in love with your data and you think your data gives you facts rather than estimates. One of the reasons I want to avoid telling you the optimal debt ratio is 37.25% is think of how many numbers underlay the 40% assumption, right? That, that the operating income be roughly what was in the most recent year. Those default spreads are rightly estimated. So basically, there, I built a castle on top of multiple assumptions. The 40% is an estimate. 
So if Disney were actually at 35.13%, I came up with an optimal of 40%. You know what humility requires you to say? They're at their optimal, I'm gonna let it go. So what I'm trying to say is, if any of your companies are at 13.53% debt and you come up with an optimal of 10%, please don't tell me they're over level because they're not. They're within the range of your optimal. So what you're looking for is outcomes that are different enough that you can draw a conclusion and say, this company's under levered or over levered because the alternative is it's where it should be. I'm not going to ask them to do. That's why I would buy at 5.23%. The optimal is 10%. I'm not going to draw a conclusion they're over levered because for all I know, the optimal could be 5.55% and they're actually closer to the optimal than with what I claim to be the optimal. So any questions on computing optimal debt ratios? So here's what we're going to do next. We're going to take that optimal debt ratio and talk about what do we do next. So think of this as the face of your project. You got the optimal for your company. You've got an actual. Now what do I do with these two numbers? So let's set the table. I'm going to talk about what you should do if your optimal is different from your actual, and then also talk about what type of debt should I use if I decide to go to the optimal. So let's take the first part of this. So let me jump ahead on your project. Let's say you've got the, op how many of you have optimal debt ratios for your companies? Or in, did you find a company over levered or under levered? I forget. Uh, okay. So it's under levered, it's too little debt. So what do you get? Over levered. Over levered. So I've got at least the two. No. Somebody want to be correctly levered? No, nobody tried. No. No. It'll happen, right? By the end of this class, you'll have, you know, in this class, there'll be under levered, there'll be over levered, there'll be close to correctly levered. If you're close to correctly levered, what should you do? Follow the Hippocratic Oath. Do no harm. You know, the reason I say this is sometimes when you're called to give advice to a company, especially if you're a consultant or a banker, and they're already doing the right thing, you feel the urge because they paid you that you need to tell them to do something. Just stop. Just tell them you're doing the right thing. Of course, they might say, you're not a good consultant. I'm going to call somebody who's going to tell me to do something. That's their problem, not yours. But if you, do, when, when, at the end of the analysis, there are only three possible conclusions. You're under levered, you're over levered, you're correctly levered. There's no fourth conclusion. If you can come up with a fourth conclusion, I'd love to see what it is. But that kind of covers the spectrum. So I want to talk about, now that you come up with that number, what do you do next? You see, what do you, first, you have to decide whether to move to the optimal. It's a choice, right? And I'm going to argue that in some companies, you might choose not to move to the optimal because the payoff is not enough. Remember that the payoff to moving to the optimal is the change in the firm value. So let's say your current debt ratio is 5%, the optimal is 20%, your firm value barely changes going from 5 to 20. You should probably stay at 5. Why? Put yourself through that disruption. But if the difference is large enough and you decide you want to move to the optimal, then I'm going to push. You need to move quickly. Or can you afford to take time? Again, if you have the choice, I'd rather that you take time. What's the advantage? Let's say your actual is 5%, the optimal is 40%. The difference is large enough. You want to move from 5 to 40. What's the advantage of moving from 5 to 40 gradually as opposed to jumping quickly? Were you sure about the 40%? You had an estimate, right? You could be wrong. The advantage of doing it gradually, you get a chance to pull back if you screwed up, something was, was wrong in your analysis. So if you have, I'm sorry? What's that, how are you gonna process? Well, when you compute the optimal, you had an operating income, right? Remember we looked at the variance. If you have a stable operating income, you're gonna feel much more certain about your optimal than if you have an unstable operating income. If you're in an economy that's developed, you're gonna feel much more certain about your optimal than if you're in an emerging market. So the underlying forces driving the numbers are going to tell you how certain you feel. So it's not some precision estimate I need. I know that I'm uncomfortable as I'm entering the numbers and I'm keeping track of that discomfort Say, hey, you no. Know. So in some companies, you might feel more confident than others about your number. You can move to the optimal. Others, you might want to do it more gradually. But I'll give you what's going to drive the conditions under which you feel the urge you have to move quickly. And 
And assuming that you want to move to the optimal, then the follow-up question is what kind of debt should we use? So today I'm gonna to focus on the first of those two and set up a framework for deciding what to do once you've computed the optimal. It's a general framework. So a door, uh, you know, to, as we go through this framework, I wanted to start thinking because you have the inputs you already have to make the choices. So first, is your company's actual debt ratio greater or less than the optimal? You can either be under levered or over levered. So you've got one under levered, one over levered. There's an intermediate step that I said, you know, assuming you found your company under levered or over levered, how much of a change in value? Because that's computed when you go, do you get it? If it's very small, you're going to say, I'm going to stop right here. But if it's large enough, then I'm going to ask you, and let's, if you're going to have a problem, which would you rather have, the under levered problem or the over levered? Which is the better problem to have? The under levered problem. It's always better to have too little debt, too much debt, you know, everything in personal life and business, etc. If you're under levered, I'm going to ask you, do you need to do something quickly? You're saying, why? If you are under levered, I'm going to argue you're the greater threat of being taken over. Think of what? If you're an under levered company, why is your company more attractive to a potential acquirer? One is there's, a, there's space to improve, and in other words, I'm making your life easy, right? I'm because, in effect, you're going to be able to borrow money using my debt capacity to buy me out. It's the ultimate insult. I'll give you the analogy. The analogy is not going to go through all the way, but hang on to it anyway. So, let's say that it's five years down the road, you bought a house, you've been very frugal. You paid off your loan. You now own the, own, the only all equity financed house in the neighborhood. You decide to have a mortgage burning party. You never heard of these, have you? In the old days in the US when people took 30 year mortgages, when they paid their final mortgage payment, they would invite all their friends over and have coffee cake and orange juice and maybe a little bit of hard alcohol. And they would physically burn the mortgage papers. Once in a while, they burnt the house down with that. You know? But let's say you have a, a safe mortgage burning party. You invited the local fireman to. And your neighbor, Bob, who's never liked you, also comes to the party. It's free food. And while he's sitting there, he's stewing. So he waits for the party to be over. And here's where the analogy is going to go off the tracks, but hang in here. So Bob decides to go to the local neighborhood bank. And he says, look, there's an all equity finance house that Dor owns in my neighborhood. I would like to borrow money against this house. This is where the analogy breaks down. You go into a bank and you try to borrow money in your neighbor's house. What's the bank usually going to say? But this is your friendly neighborhood bank. Let's stay with the analogy. And he says, no problem, Bob. Here's $400,000. Dor now takes the 400,000 and he does a hostile acquisition of door. I don't know how this would work. Maybe you have kids and the kids are disloyal and they sell their share saying, you know, you give me a bigger room, I'll sell my share. So Bob now owns 51% of the house and he throws door out of the house. This could never happen in a house. Thank God for that. But let's assume you have a company, a publicly traded company that's at a billion dollars can afford to borrow 600,000 or 600 million is chosen not to. Why? Because the CEO is very conservative. He doesn't like to borrow money or she doesn't like to borrow money. I eye that house and say, look, that company can have 600,000 in debt. I go to the friendly neighborhood bank and I say, will you lend me 600,000, 600 million against the, and here's where the analogy will break down again. The bank is going to, and this is where Drexel Burnham and Mike Milken broke the game open. What did they create? They created a market for original issuance, high yield bonds, basically bonds that were unrated and without any backing. Prior to the 1980s, if you had no backing when you issued bonds, nobody would buy the bonds. There was no market. But if you said, you know, Mike Milken discovered that if you set the rate high enough, people would buy these bonds. So here's what I do. I go to the junk bond market. I raised 600 million on the implicit backing that I'm going to buy a company and I named the company and I plan to retire the debt using that cash. And because I have a track record of having done this before, 
bondholders buy my bonds. So I now have $600 million that I borrowed implicitly against your assets. I use the 600 million to buy your company. And you made things even nicer for me because as a conservative CEO, in addition to not borrowing money, what do conservative managers tend to accumulate in companies? They tend to accumulate big cash balances. It makes it even easier. I buy the company, then I use your cash. to this. It, you can't make it any sweeter for me as an acquirer, right? I borrowed money against your assets. I use your cash to pay down the debt, and it's now my company. So when you have an underlevered company, the first question I'm going to ask you is, are you the potential target of a takeover? And go and go look at the Wall Street Journal and say, look, I don't see a new story of me being taken. I'm saying, look at the conditions in your company to see if they're going to make you likely to be taken over. And let's look at some of the things you're going to look at. Anybody doing Microsoft? Nobody wants to admit to it, right? If you do Microsoft and you do the optimal debt ratio, it turns out to be under level by a significant amount. Is it a potential target of a takeover? Remember, it's got to be a hostile takeover. How much money would you need to take over Microsoft? Trillion. trillion and a half, two and a half, two trillion dollars. That's going to be a bit of a problem, right? So larger companies can get away with being under levered and perhaps map out a more gradual path. But if you're a hundred million dollar company or a half a billion dollar company, you got to worry more. In fact, that threshold keeps getting raised. 40 years ago, if you're more than a billion dollars, you felt safe. Now you've got to be more than 20, 30, 40 billion dollars to feel safe. So first thing I'm going to ask you is, how big are you as a company? What's your market cap? So that's the first factor, size of the company. Second, what's the other problem you're going to run into in Microsoft that might make a hostile takeover a little difficult? Well, I mean, you know, they're going to face that no matter what, right? Whether I would, in fact, they might argue that I'm a less likely threat to be a monopoly than the existing owners. Remember when you looked at the top 17 shareholders in a company we are looking for? Uh, so remember, this is a hostile share takeover. Bill Gates still owns, I think, five, six percent of the company. I don't know. You go down the list. Steve Bomber's probably on the list. They're not going to be your allies. If you can make them your allies, great. But if, so you're, the second thing you're going to look at is what percentage of the shares in this company are held by insiders. The larger the insider holding, the more difficult it becomes for an outsider to do a hostile acquisition. So you're going to look at the size of the company. You're going to look at insider holdings. And here's the third factor to consider. In every hostile acquisition, you have two sides competing for the group that so far has not been soft out the shareholders. The managers are telling the shareholders, don't sell to that hostile acquirer. He doesn't care about you. The hostile acquirers are telling the shareholders, don't worry about the managers. They've never cared about you. And you get to judge who to trust. So I'm going to throw in a third factor that might tip your trust. What if I told you that your stock has been down 70% over the last five years? Who are you going to trust? Who's, running, who's been running the company for the last five years? The existing managers. So if your stock is down significantly, you're more likely to become the target of a hostile. Is this something you've computed or should have computed over the last few weeks on your company that will give you a sense of how well or badly your stock has done after adjusting for the market and after adjusting for risk? When you ran that regression on your stock against a market, you compared to Jensen's Alpha. If your Jensen's Alpha was minus 10, minus 15, minus 30%, you should start worrying because that means that when somebody targets your company, you can no longer can say, well, everybody was doing badly. You were doing worse than the sector, worse than the market. That's a trifecta. If you're a smaller or mid-sized company with low insider holdings and a big negative Jensen's Alpha, don't sit around mapping five-year plans to change your debt ratio. Do something quickly, or somebody will do it for you. So if you're the target of a hostile, if, if you're a target of an acquisition, you don't have the luxury of time. You've got to move quickly. And there are two ways you can increase your debt ratio essentially overnight. One is to do what's called a debt for equity swap. What's a debt for equity swap? How does it work? <laughs> 
What do you do? But how does it work? You can't force lenders to convert to equity. You can, so offer, it you can offer, you go to your existing lenders, con even convertible bonds, you can't force conversion, right? The stock price has to be high enough. But if you have lenders in your company, you can go and offer them an equivalent amount in market value of equity, perhaps with a little bonus thrown and say, will you take it? They don't have to. That's why debt for equity swaps work with small companies because you might have you know, 20 big shareholders and you can go to one of them. So debt for equity swap is for small companies who want to change the debt ratio. What does it accomplish? It takes 100 million in debt, which uh, you know, 100 million that was debt until yesterday makes it into equity today. Overnight, you replace debt with equity. But if that doesn't work, and most of the time it won't, here's the quickest way to change your debt ratio. You go borrow the money and you buy back stock. Borrowing the money increases debt, buying back stock reduces equity. You borrow the money and pay a special dividend. Borrowing money increases debt, paying the special dividends reduces equity. By moving both at the same time in opposite directions, you can change your debt ratio from 10% to 50% or 70% essentially overnight. So if you want to move quickly, that's what you do. But let's say you're a company that's either too big to be a target of a hostile acquisition or too difficult to acquire. And this is where your corporate governance part can help you, right? Because in the corporate governance part, one of the questions you asked was, how much power do you have in this company? So if you have a Chinese company, you might say there's zero chance of a hostile acquisition because we looked in the corporate governance part and there are all these impediments to doing a hostile acquisition. They've separated the, the, the operating company from the holding company by putting it in the Cayman Islands. You don't want to do a hostile acquisition of Baidu, the Cayman Islands entity, because what the heck are you going to do with that, that acquisition? So if your company is not the target of a takeover, then you have the luxury of time. So now I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. You still have that, that capacity. I'm going to ask you, do you have good projects? Now, if I ask any management this question and I let them tell me, you know what they're going to tell me. Of course, I have good projects. So I'm not going to trust you on your word. I want some proof. So what is the other number that you've computed already or I've computed for Disney that will tell me whether the company has good projects or not? Completely blacked out the first half of this class, haven't you? Remember we computed the return on capital for the company versus the cost of capital. We made a judgment on collectively, does this company have good projects or not? If your company has good projects and you have excess debt capacity, you have a double whammy. You borrow money that lowers your cost of capital. That's a good thing. You take good, what's the definition of a good project from a capital budgeting perspective? It has a positive NPV. And what happens when you take a positive NPV project? It increases your value. So basically using ex excess debt capacity to take good or great projects is your best case scenario. And if you can pull that off, that's what I'm going to encourage you to do. If you don't have good projects, you're in a bad business, your return capital is less than the cost of capital. I'm gonna argue, don't force it. You have excess debt capacity. You don't have to do anything right away, but there are things you can do over time that will make your debt ratio go up. Like what? Paying more in dividends, right? Every time you pay dividends, it reduces equity. Buying back, adding, augmenting your dividends with stock buybacks over time. And here you do it over three or four or five years and get a chance to pull back if you overdone. So that's if you're under leverage. They said, let's go to the other prompt, the worst prompt. What if you have too much debt? Well, if you have too much debt, again, the question I'm going to ask you is how much time do you have? And here there's a morbid ring to the question, right? Because if you have too much debt, what am I worried about? Not that you're going to get taken over, but that you could go bankrupt. So I'm going to ask you, are you under threat of bankruptcy? Say, how will I know? You will know. If you ever worked at a company under threat of bankruptcy, everybody knows, right? The janitor knows you're in trouble. Sometimes it's, it's very clear. Your rating has dropped to triple C. You're not sitting there. Bad, bath and beyond. I don't think anybody's sitting there. I wonder whether we're under bankruptcy threat. If they are, they're in severe denial. Of course you're under bankruptcy threat. You're having trouble making your interest payments. You got to do something quickly. And I want to suggest something that's going to sound completely odd. 
This is your moment of maximum leverage as a borrower. Why? What do you hold over the lender's head that if they don't agree to you? So you enter into an agreement with the lenders. Say, look, you know, this is like negotiating with a guy who owes you money, but he's got a gun to his head. Say, agree to my terms or I'll blow my brains out. You never see it. That's basically what you're doing here, essentially negotiating and saying, look, I'm going to give you some terms. You might not like them, but if you don't take them, I'm going to throw myself at the mercy of the courts and the lawyers will take everything. So here are some of the things you can do to try to bring your debt ratio down. None of them are going to be acceptable at first sight to the lenders. But they might have to bend because if they don't do it, they're going to end up with often nothing or wait 15 years to get it. One is you go to your lenders and say, would you like some equity in your firm? What's your first reaction if you're a lender to Bed Bath & Beyond? I said, would you like some equity in my firm? I said, no, I please, no. I don't want equity in your firm. I said, would you like equity or would you like nothing? So I'll take the equity. You go to your lender and say, you have a three-year loan, right? Let's make it a 30-year loan. Just add a zero at the end. What's the big deal? And the 10% rate, let's make it delayed, right? 1% for the first five years and then 10% afterwards. Again, you don't want to do it, but what choice do you have? You can try to sell assets to pay down debt. I said, try. You know why it's so difficult? Because everybody knows you're desperate. You get bargain basement. There are no easy outs here, right? Basically, you're at the end of your, you're, you're at the edge of the cliff. You're trying to get the best terms you can to keep going. In fact, my favorite example of how companies sometimes negotiate, you know, how borrowers sometimes negotiate terms when they're in desperation that lenders have to accept comes from Latin America. Late 1800s. Latin America had another one of their default crises, it's like the epicenter of default, right? Sovereign default, you know. Right? So if you draw a picture of sovereign default, Latin America is right there, right? red spot. So it's a Latin American country that had borrowed money from a French bank. So the time for the interest payment comes to you. The country doesn't have the money to pay it. So they go, they, I don't know, that time they couldn't call the French bank. Maybe they telegraphed the French bank saying, no money for interest. Would you accept something else in return? The bank says, like what? It says, like guano. This bird droppings. Good fertilizer. We can put, what's your first reaction if you're a bank and I offer you bird droppings instead of interest payments? I don't want that. And the French bank initially said, we don't want bird droppings. So would you like bird droppings? Or would you like nothing? bank thought about it for a moment said put the bird droppings on chips and send it to us this is one of the most famous cases i mean it's i always wondered in 2010 2011 when greece was in trouble why didn't it offer to pay in olives or wine you know what we don't have the cash i mean in a sense you're using your desperation to extract the best stuff. it sounds amoral maybe it is but in a sense, survival becomes your key factor. What can I do? So if you're in trouble, then you're going to have to do whatever you can to survive. And that's why being, you know, if you can be a fly on the wall in restructuring talks, you're going to hear some really strange ideas being thrown out there. Your first reaction is, why would anybody agree to this? It's because at the moment of desperation, you take whatever you can get. If you're not under bankruptcy threat, and remember many of your over levered firms, there's no threat of bankruptcy. You're still triple B, single A rated. You still have no trouble making your interest payments. You still have growth assets. Then you have the luxury of time again. And there again, I'm gonna ask you the same question I asked you when you had excess debt capacity. Do you have good projects? And if you do, then I'm going to push you to take those good projects with equity. You think, what equity? Remember, over time, you get retained earnings, right? Stop paying dividends. That's my first advice to companies that are over leveraged. Stop paying dividends, take your entire earnings, put them back into the business, and over time, you will grow your equity. You don't even have to retire your debt. You'll grow yourself out of the debt problem by making your equity value higher. If you don't have good projects, then of course, you have no choice but to try to use that same retained earnings to pay down debt over time. And again, as I said, cut off dividends because you shouldn't be paying dividends as an over-levered company. So under-levered, over-levered, work your way through to see what works for your company.
So I tried this on Disney. Is the company under or over levered? It was clearly under levered. Is it under, under threat of bankruptcy, under threat of takeover? I didn't think so. $135 billion company that put it at a fairly large, it's not a trillion dollar company, but $135 billion is fairly significant. Yeah. Now, it could be a friendly takeover target, right? There's all actually, actually talk that Apple could take over Disney, you know, and it's a potential target, but on a, on a hostile takeover, probably not likely. But to show you how my views on that have shifted in the last 25 years, the first time I looked at Disney, the first edition of my applied corporate finance book in 1997, Disney was on top of the world. Michael Eisner was a great CEO. Nobody was challenging Disney. I said, not likely to be takeover target. Second edition I wrote in 2003. By 2003, Disney had halved. It's, it wasn't even 2003, 2001. Disney had halved its market value while everybody else was doubling theirs. Michael Eisner was now one of the most hated CEOs on the face of the earth. And I went from definitely not a takeover target to likely a takeover target. In fact, you know how you could tell that Disney was getting worried in 2003 and 2004 that maybe taken over? There was a lot of talk about how much they cared about shareholders. Watch for this talk when CEOs start to tell you how much they care about shareholders. It's not because they've had, you know, they wake up to God moment. It's because they're scared that something is going to happen and they're getting their defenses ready. I just remember about uh, 20 years ago, now in the late 90s, until the late 90s, European companies thought they were immune from hostile takeovers. Why? But the system was structured in such a way that it was very difficult to take over a main, a mainland Europe. UK, you could do it. But mainland Europe, European companies felt that you couldn't do a hostile takeover. Can you imagine trying to borrow from an Italian bank to try to take over a fiat? That's not going to go well, right? The bankers will essentially say, no way, that's an institution. Until the late 90s, a company called Telecom Italia, at that time, the monopoly Italian <coughs> telecommunications company, got acquired in a hostile takeover. How did, the, how did they do it? Well, they bypassed the banks. They went directly to the bond market. They raised the money. They did a hostile acquisition. It shocked European CEOs. So they decided to have, you know, what CEOs do whenever there's a crisis, they call a conference, They're all these CEOs. And I was unfortunate enough to be put on the panel with a bunch of European C CEOs about the threat of hostile acquisitions in Europe. Sitting next to the Siemens CEO and he gets up and he said, at Siemens, we care deeply about our shareholders and I almost fell out of my chair. This is a company that's treated shareholders like mosquitoes, right? You want a dividend, go away now, right? You had your dividend. And I mean, listening to this guy talk about how much he cared about shareholders, I got the same reaction I got when I heard Madonna sing like a virgin. It was my reaction, how would you know? Was it a deeply embedded memory that you're pulling up? I mean, if Siemens ever cared about shareholders, it stopped caring a long time ago. But you know what that told me, right? Siemens was worried about, hey, what will this mean for us as a company now that shareholders can potentially mount a threat to us? So watch for that. If you see CEOs, top management talking a great deal about how much they care about shareholders, something is going on under the surface. In the case of Disney, I've gone back and forth and I'm back to a point where I don't think they're a target. You know, Bob Chapek had stayed on a couple more years, who knows, right? So you see this kind of ebb and flow. Is it, does it have good projects? At least based on my calculation of return on capital in 2013, 12.61% versus their cost of capital. It looked like they had good projects and they had this new theme park coming up in Shanghai. You know, their, their Pixar, their Marvel and their Star Wars investments are all kicking in. So my advice to Disney is you have excess debt capacity, use it to build up these businesses you have to invest. In. But it's not forever, right? In 2020, my advice would be different. Now they have started throwing money into Disney Plus. I'm a little worried about what they might do with excess debt capacity. You can see your views and companies ebb and flow as the company changes over time. Any questions on what to do after you've come up with the op 
So look at the change in firm value. If it's very small, you might say, I'm going to stop here. It's, there's not much gain by going to the optimum. If you decide to go to the optimum, then you got to decide, do I move quickly? Do I move gradually? And that's going to be driven if you're under levered by whether you're the threat, under threat of takeover. And if you're over levered by whether you worry about bankruptcy. So that's going to bring you to a point where you have to decide what to do next. If you decide that you have to move quickly, let's very quickly review your choices. If you have too little debt to increase your debt ratio, you know, you can sell operating assets and use cash. So if you want to increase the debt ratio, you can use it to buy back stock or pay a special dividend. So you can sell the assets, use the cash, and that effectively lowers the value of the firm and also lowers the value of the So basically it increases your debt ratio. If you want to do a buyback, you can do it purely. On, so in one, you're actually affecting both sides of the balance sheet. The other, you're just changing the debt to recapitalization. Similarly, if you're over, if you're, if you're going to decrease your debt ratio, you can sell assets and use the cash to pay down debt. But as you saw with Bed Bath and Beyond, that's going to be tough to do because everybody knows you're desperate and you're going to get the prices that reflect it. Or you can try to do the reverse of what you did before, which is sort of borrowing money and buying back stock, you issue equity with all the challenges of issuing equity as a trouble company and use the equity to pay down debt. The one opening that you could potentially use if you're trouble is you're very risky. You say, what is that good? It's not good if you're issuing equity. It's not good if you're issuing debt. But if you're very risky, what's the only security that actually goes up in value with risk? What's the only type of asset? Options do. That's why you use convertible bonds, use warrants, because that's you're exploiting the only thing you have left, right? So you look at what Bed Bath & Beyond was proposing in February, issuing convertible debt, which is mostly conversion and very little debt. And warrants, they were trying to take advantage of the only thing that they could, given their risk, which is people who buy the option. You, know, you raise the option. So if you issue warrants, which are a type of equity, you can use the equity to pay down the debt, but you're still on the verge of desperation. Now, if you have the luxury of time and you're trying to bring your debt ratio down over time, there are a couple of things to factor in. One is we know the direction. If you want to reduce equity, you want to do dividends and stock buybacks. If you want to reduce debt, you've got to do debt repayments. But here's the challenge. If you change right now, your firm value is given, right? So you know what the value of the firm is. So to go from 20% debt to 40% debt and your value of the firm is a billion dollars, you go from 200 million to 400 million. But if you say, look, I want to go from 20% debt now to 40% five years from now, that 40% is not of a billion dollars. It'll be whatever your expected value will be five years from now. And so how the heck am I going to find that? Well, remember your equity, if you have estimated the value correctly, will grow at your cost of equity. So basically, there's the price appreciation portion. And your debt, if you don't borrow money, will stay con. So in, a, in other words, you can estimate what the value of your firm will be. But 40% debt ratio five years from now will often be more than $400 million because the firm is going to be a much bigger firm. So you can work it out mechanically, but it's a little bit of a challenge because it's like chasing a target that's moving. And it is moving over time. So let's get started on the right kind of debt for a company. So when you design debt, you want to combine the best of equity with the best of debt. What's the best part of debt? What's the biggest advantage? Tax benefits. What's the biggest advantage of using equity? Flexibility, right? Which is if you're paying dividends, you can suspend them legally if you're in trouble. So you get flexibility with equity, you get tax benefits from debt. Wouldn't it be great if you could create a security that combined those features that you got the tax benefits of debt with the flexibility of equity. That's our dream when you design the perfect financing for a company. You want to design financing that behaves like equity around you, is flexible, but gives you the tax benefits of debt. So I'm going to start by showing you the dangers of mismatching debt to assets. You saw that with, you know, with, uh, with Silicon Valley Bank, but you can see it with, with any company that mismatches. So to illustrate the danger, here's my value as a firm going up and down because you know, macro factors affect me. So values change all, all the time. 
Let's say I borrow money that stays the same value no matter what happens to my firm value. This company is going to be technically bankrupt every time the value of the firm drops below the debt. It's kind of an obvious statement. I'm going to state it anyway. So when you borrow money, that's what you worry about. So if I have fixed debt, then I've got the most I can borrow if I want to eliminate the chance of debt is to actually set my debt below my lowest possible firm value. But there's another choice. What if you can create debt whose value goes up when my firm value goes up and goes down when my firm value goes down? This company has twice as much debt as the previous company, but it never gets into trouble. Now I've kind of overreached you because you're never going to design debt this perfectly, but that's what you're aspiring to do. Make your value of debt and the value of the firm move together so you don't get into trouble. So I'm going to take you through the process of designing the perfect debt for a company. You can use it on any company, but use it on your own business if you run a business to see whether you can get this match going. So here's the first step. You're a company, you come to me and say, what type of debt should I borrow? That's the first mistake. You shouldn't be asking outsiders, what's the right debt for me? Because you know who you're going to be asking, right? probably going to be asking an investment bank, well, what's the right debt for me? And that's analogous to walking in an electronics store and asking, what's the right TV for me? You're never going to come home with the right TV. You're going to come home with the right TV for the salesperson, not for you. So it's a question, who knows your business best? You or an investment banker who walked in yesterday? You should, right? The ingredients for designing debt lie in understanding your own business. And let's go through some of the questions you need to ask and answer to design your perfect debt. First, you've got to ask, what type of projects do I have? Are they really long-term or are they pretty short-term? Let's take two companies. You take Boeing. What does a typical project for Boeing look like? They probably had only, what, 10 projects over their lifetime? 707, 727, 737, the Dreamliner that seems to be the project that never gets started. But essentially, projects that last 50, 60, 70 years, right? 25 years of R&D. I think the last 747 rolled off the assembly lines 38 years after the first one did. So they obviously sell for a long time. Yesterday, I was in a United flight and it looks like they're going to buy 200 Dreamliners. I don't think they're planning to buy 200 next year, but clearly it tells you something. So what does that tell me? If I'm Boeing, I, can afford, I should be taking really long-term debt. In fact, Boeing was one of two companies that issued 100-year corporate bonds a couple of decades ago. You know what the other company was? It was Disney. So I don't know what part of Disney they use for the 100-year bonds, but Boeing, you can see 100-year bonds. In contrast, if you take Facebook with their metaverse investments, the duration of your investment Technology shifts all the time. If you're lucky, maybe two, three, four. This is not a hundred year investment, right? Because things change too much. So if Facebook is borrowing money. I would expect them to borrow short term debt. In fact, one of the things I suggested you do for your company is, what does a typical project look like for your company? For some companies, this is easy to do, right? What does a typical project look like for the Home Depot? It's another store, right? So you say this is... So, and you can very quickly, but for some companies, it's fuzzier. And for Disney, as you can see, it depends on what business you're in. So long-term projects, long-term debt. Second, I'm going to ask you, what currency do your cash flows come in? With Boeing, what's the answer? It depends on who I'm selling the aircraft to, right? If I'm selling the aircraft to Singapore Airlines, I'm going to get my cash flows in Singapore dollars. If I'm selling them to United, I'm going to get them in US dollars. You give me a pie chart of, the currencies your revenues coming in. I look at your debt, say your, your debt, should, if you're doing this right, should have roughly the same pie chart. This is in rocket science. How long term, what currency? Third, I'm going to ask a question that's going to sound odd, but you're going to see the reason I need the answer. So how much pricing power do you have? I mean, we're in, in a decade where inflation seems to have come back into the game. What does pricing power mean? That you can pass that inflation through to your customers. The greater your pricing power, the better a candidate you are for floating rate debt than a company without the pricing power. And think a while. If you look at floating rate debt, how does it work? Your interest rate gets reset every year based on whatever some the, the LIBOR rate is or the T-bond rate is, some, some core rate, right? 
And the biggest driver of interest rates over time, as we saw earlier in this class, is inflation. Inflation goes up, interest rates go up, inflation comes down, interest rates come down. So if you issue floating rate debt, you know your rates are going to go up and down with inflation. But if you have pricing power, you don't worry about as much because if inflation goes up and interest payments go up, you just pass it through to your customers. I'm not saying you're happy about it, but you're going to be able to cover your interest payments. In contrast, if you have no pricing power and you take floating rate debt. Think of what's going to happen. Inflation goes up, your interest payments go up. But you have no pricing power. So you're a company with higher inflation. Your costs go up but your revenues don't climb accordingly, you get squeezed, you shouldn't be issuing floating rate debt. Airlines should never issue floating rate debt. Some of them do, but if you do it, you're asking for trouble. So how much pricing power do you have? And the more pricing power you have, the better you are as a candidate for floating rate debt. Finally, you have a choice between straight debt and convertible debt. Straight debt, you issue debt, there's an interest payment, convertible debt, you add a conversion option. Now, if you look at coupon rates, Convertible debt will always look cheaper to you than straight debt because it has a lower coupon rate. But that's misleading, right? Because you've added this valuable equity option. You think, which one should I use? If you're a company that's a growth company and you want to borrow money, tell me what your characteristics are. Right now, you don't have much in terms of cash flows because everything's going back to the company. So you'd like to keep your interest payments low up front. Later on, you know you're going to be okay because you're going to become a more mature company. Growth companies are much better candidates for convertible debt because they can keep their interest payments low in the early years, but they can't afford it. And mature companies shouldn't be issuing convertible debt. What are you doing giving away equity options in a mature company when you don't need to? Think of how much of debt design we fix, how long-term, what currency, fixed or floating rate, is straight or convertible. That's 90% of debt design right there. And then I'm going to come to the fun part. Tell me what else affects your business. And I'm going to try to bring it into the debt. I'm going to create a special design for debt. Take an example, you're a gold mining company. What drives your earnings every year? Price. Gold prices, right? So if you borrow money, what are you worried about? What if gold prices go down? Will I be able to make my interest payments? Is there a way I could design a bond where you could borrow money and not have to worry about that? What did you do? Payments are variable to the gold price. Tie the coupon rate to the gold price, right? You think, can I do that? You can do whatever you want contractually. People will price it in. The very first commodity bonds were called were gold link bonds issued by a gold mining company. It was called Sunshine Mine. The coupon rate was tied to the gold price. The gold price was high. The coupon rate went up. Gold prices dropped off. The coupon rate went down. If you're an insurance company and you want to borrow money, what are you worried about? Nice earnings right now. You look good. You can borrow money. What could very quickly, a Katrina. What does Katrina do to insurance companies? You get this huge catastrophe, a flood, an earthquake, and all of a sudden you go from being in really good shape to not that good shape because a catastrophe or a disaster created these huge payouts. You say, what can I do about that? I'm not going to borrow money. You could, if you could put in a clause that says, if there's a catastrophe like that, and you got to get lawyers to specify what a catastrophe is, a flood that causes more than 5 billion in damage, an earthquake that measures more, more than eight on the Richter scale, then I will suspend coupon payments legally for five years and perhaps even lower my principal payments for the catastrophe. You might say, well, you can't do that. You can. It's called a catastrophe bond. They're issued by small insurance companies because if they did not have those protections, they could never borrow money. Now, this is not a free lunch. When you put these special features into bonds, guess what happened? The interest rate you have to pay on those bonds. They'll go up. But you're saying, look, if I don't put these in, I will never borrow money. So I'm willing to pay the... So this is not about ripping people off. And to show you how extraordinary bonds can get, there was actually a, and this is a true story. There's a company that made swimming pool stuff for the, you know, you know, for the East Coast primarily was the, and they actually tied the bonds they issued to the temperature during the summer because their entire business was driven by do you have a hot summer, an average summer, a cool summer? There was an Italian soccer team. I, you know, I'll have to look up the name of the team and send you the story. 
that I'd been relegated to this, I don't know what the equivalent of the second division was in Italian soccer, but they'd built this big stadium that they'd borrowed money on and the coupon rate on the bond was tied to whether they made it back to the first division, stayed in the second division or went further down. And my favorite of all time are Bowie bonds. Heard of David Bowie, right? The guy with the spiky hair, you know, he died. I don't know when he died. But, but in, the, in, the, in the 1990s, David Bowie had a tussle or an argument with this record company and he bought back the rights to all of his music, which left him with a cash flow problem. Rock star cash flow problem don't go together. So he decided to fix the cash flow problem. He went to Banker in New York, legendary by now who created these bonds where he tied the coupon rate on the bond to how many records. And these were the days before iTunes, we actually sold records. So how many records David Bowie sold? If David, I mean, think of how much more interesting those, the bond market would be if you had Bowie bonds and Madonna bonds and you know tied to different characteristics of people, the Taylor Swift bonds. So every time she breaks up with a boyfriend, that'll be an extra coupon for me. You know? So, because that's another song coming, right? So you can, it would, but, but basically what you're trying to do is tie whatever affects the cash flows of the company to the bond so that you get the same kind of cash flows. So the first step in bond design is making sure you create a bond that's right for you. Second step, why are you doing all of this? You want to make sure you get the tax benefits, right? But what have you designed? You've designed a bond that behaves like equity and you might've done such a good job that the IRS might agree with you and say, that's equity. We're not going to give you the tax benefits. Your second stop should be at the tax lawyer's office. If your company has one, if it doesn't, go find a tax lawyer and make sure that the bond you've design, you, you're designing is a bond that will actually still get you the tax benefits. And actually, the IRS will actually allow you to get you know, they will, you can offer, send them the bond. They, the only thing the IRS will say is we cannot be bound by our own advice to you on the bond, which kind of makes it useless, but you can at least get a sense of, am I making sure that I get the tax benefits? And sometimes you might have to massage the bond to maximize your tax benefits. So you're a European company and you want to borrow in euros, but much of your revenues are in Ireland, you might still decide to place the bond in Germany because you get a much bigger tax benefit in Germany than you do in Ireland. So you're taking your perfect bond and you're accepting compromises to maximize your tax benefits. Third stop, and this is a real challenge, is you've got different groups wanting you to do, do different things on debt. Maybe, you know, rather than be abstract, let me be specific. So let's say you're the CEO of a Midwestern company. You plan to raise some capital this summer. And you decide to take a trip to New York. There's three groups you got to meet. The first is the ratings agency. So you stop at the Moody's office in the morning. And remember, they care about the fortress. So what do you have to convince them that this, the financing is equity or debt? What do they want you to do as the ratings agency? What, what makes you safer? Equity. equity. So that you want to convince them that it, what you're issuing is really equity. You say, what's the big deal? The afternoon, you stop in front of the equity research analyst group. Now, remember, when you issue equity, what do you have to do? You have to issue shares that creates a dilution problem. And you mentioned the word dilution in front of a group of equity research analysts. They all start swooning and saying, this is awful. You're a terrible company. So here's what you have to do. You have to take that group and convince that group that what you convinced the rating agency in the morning was equity has now magically become debt. So how am I going to do that? You're going to see the tricks that bankers sometimes have to play to convince two different groups that they're getting two different things. But if you're regulated, there's a third stop to make. Third stop, you got to go back in front of the regulatory capital guy and they want you to have equity because it makes you safer. So you, you have financing that started the morning as equity, in the middle of the day became debt and the end of the day went back to being equity. You saw this with Credit Suisse, right? Where you issue you know, in, in, in effect, debt, and you may convince the regulatory guys, it's really equity, because look at these clauses we put in. So I'll give you this strange and weird example of a security that was created in the early 90s, precisely for this reason, to keep different groups convinced that they were getting the best of all worlds. It's called trust preferred stock. 
Now, without any judgment, I want, I'll describe trust preferred and you tell me whether you'd put in the debt column or the equity column. Remember the, the criteria go for debt, fixed payment, tax deductible, loss of control. Here's how trust preferred stock works. It comes with a fixed dividend that's set at the time, the securities issue. That dividend is tax deductible. And if you fail to make that dividend payment, you got to give the trust preferred shareholders voting rights in your company. Fixed dividend, tax deductible, loss of control. So you're going to put in the debt or equity pile. Which pile would you put it in? It looks like debt to me. But for whatever reason, when it was first created, the ratings agencies decided to treat it as equity. I still talk to the, and I remember talking to one of the people who sat on that committee that classified as equity, because I was completely bamboozled. Why would you do this? The guy gave me a couple of reasons, one incredibly stupid and one mildly stupid. And I'll give you the incredibly stupid reason first. He said it was called preferred stock. Really? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go on a renaming convention on everything on my balance sheet. Those bank loans? No, no, we don't call them that here. We call them bank preferred stock. You can't. That's the incredibly stupid reason. You can't classify something as debt or equity based on what it's called. The second one had a tinge of truth to it. He said equity is usually a perpetual security. Debt usually comes to the finite maturity. Trust preferred does not have a maturity date. Therefore, we decide it was closer to equity. Sounds reasonable, right? But how long did we, did I say the, the Boeing and the Disney bonds, what, what was the maturity of those bonds? 100 year bonds, right? Let's say you buy a 100 year bond. Do you think you're going to be around to collect the principal on this bond? Unless you're an incredibly optimistic person, you're going to be dead, right? So once you get to 100, why can't I make it a thousand? A hundred thousand. You stop caring. So you see where I'm going, right? Once you start, if you tell me that 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 having a time horizon makes something into debt, I'm going to take all my debt and make it perpetual debt. Might have to pay a slightly higher interest rate for it. Yeah. Yep. And companies, when you set up a company, don't you set up a, is it a, like a life? Not for the company, right? No corporate charter ever comes to the life. Ever. But in the US or everywhere. everywhere. If you have a publicly traded company, publicly traded companies have charters in perpetual. That's why we use a perpetual life in a discounted cash flow valuation. In theory, there is no time at which a corporate charter has to be shut down. Equity is a perpetual security, it doesn't come with a finite life. But as I said, that can't be the reason for classifying something. So the bottom line is trust preferred is debt. It took a while for the ratings agencies to discover it was debt. You know how they finally discovered? A company that issued only trust preferred went bankrupt. They had a really big problem to explain away how a company's all equity finance went bankrupt. And finally, they classified it as debt. So you know what the bankers did? They created more convoluted security. So this is the game. When we start next class, we'll talk about how you, know, you start to create these more and more convoluted securities because it becomes a game. Really? For a corporate charge? Yeah. That's weird. Maybe that's the problem in Argentina. <laughs> that he takes that life. Oh, that's why I'm very tired. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay. Uh,
No, las empresas siempre son porque no sabes si dentro de ocho meses se vaya a Bolivia. Yeah. 
So what why does it come to the Holy Spirit is what is going to happen? You should be, I mean you should have it's not that people is freedom. And this is exactly what goes to the yeah. actual opportunity. Yeah. You should be an item of freedom if you want to yeah. and not get to one the other. So I know that you can look at it really well. It is it would need to be packed up to stay to the like that and it's down to that. I just wonder what's um rational. Well, I think it captures the because of trying to do the full run fracture. And the other approach of keeping the thing that is fixed and just taking the change and the tables and so on, right? So not doing a full fresh graduation. Whereas in this approach, I'm actually trying to do a full fresh graduation and set about it. If I had the luxury of time, I'd probably do a two stage model where I think the higher growth goes to the other than this, and then I should have seen but I can't do that in this section. Okay. So that's why I kind of left it at the higher growth. Oh, so I guess I better pass the other section, which is then like for my from the optimal to zero percent, then we can pass it down to zero percent and just reduce it to like five percent. Okay. Well, so what do you want a number in there? Is it you know, close to zero? Just say yeah. 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 Uh, first place. Um, first place, when you're doing the ETB, I think, like I said, um, I just that when you're doing the ETB, like the rough bankruptcy policy, like 0.66% and then tying the quarter of the firm value, the quarter with that. That's, yeah, that's just made up number. That's the bankruptcy cost is a percent of value as the customers who stop buying. That's the, that's the like, is that the, that's the indirect cost of bankruptcy? Yeah. Okay, I see. It's both direct and indirect, but a big chunk of it's indirect. Oh, so for 0.66. It's a probability. Uh, yeah, and that's multiplied by the five to 10% of the firm value and the 25% you were. No, the, the five to 10% is in the firm value. Gotcha, okay. And you just sort of estimate that based on both. The yeah, same way that the form and the growth is going to. All right. And then when we're talking about like the debt or equity swap mm -hmm. to change leverage quickly, I kind of understood, I understood, you know, offering lenders equity to pay off the debt. But if you're trying to go the other direction, if you're trying to in increase your debt load, you, you can do you can do the market option. cap to market cap. That's the essence of swap. It's the people that will lend lend it stock and buy corporate bonds anyway. Oh, okay, so you just pay that. Debt. At the gotcha. you can buy debt bonds and options to incur it to put in the market. Gotcha. And then the last question was for the project. I was trying to do the market value of debt for my company. And I so I went to the like on the Bloomberg channel with the print it's a principal, it seemed like due by year. And I was wondering if there was a way to change that to also show the interest for it, both combined to do it to do a great maturity. Yeah, exactly. Do the DBIS will actually give you the rate maturity, right? Well, if that's, that's what I did, and I, I, I made the it didn't give you the rate of maturity. You should maybe that. Maybe I missed it, but I I didn't think I saw a way to. I'll, I'll, I'll run it again. I'll, I'll Otherwise, it says, you know, say it's just taking the principal. Just use the principal, and okay. And there also was something weird in there where it was 100% you know, pretty much corporate bonds, but then there was what they call like amount available. And that's a value net of the credit. So that's just like a little older form. So I can ignore that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Hi, 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 so uh, the first question just wants to be as to the table we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so if the firm is on the ladder, um, if and if the debt is poorly managed, yeah. then you mentioned probably doing the debt all debt after all, all or on yeah, not debt. just that it's poorly managed, it's got to be targeted. Mm -hmm. So the poorly managed, you can't take it over because yeah, you can't even pay it by three shares, you can't do much. So if it's if it's poorly managed and it is possible for somebody to come take it over, then you got to do something for them. Yeah, so yeah. I guess my question would be like it it would be like very costly like issue that, right? In that case, like, why is it very costly? Mm -hmm. Depending on what debt ratio you're going to, why is it? Why is it? Why is what cost are you talking about? If it's like, let's say, in, in, the, in the scenario you mentioned, the stock price dropped by 70%, and it's going to be a great deal more than the cash flows, right? You don't borrow against market value. So, what does the stock price have to do? If somebody lends you money, their lending is based on the earnings and cash flows. So if you have earnings and cash flows, they're going to be enough to cover the debt. And your optimal debt ratio already took that into account, right? When you computed the optimal debt ratio, you computed based on the fact that if the earnings to get to the bottom, we're not going to an arbitrary higher debt ratio. Right? We're going to go to a debt ratio you computed as the optimal. Presumably, in your cost of capital calculations, you factor in one of the earnings and cash flows for that. 
So I'm not sure why having a stock goes up is of any consequence that much to be boring. Okay. Yeah. 